Lucinda Bromfield, who um, has been working with the BPP and myself at Portsmouth. And uh, what we do is from time to time, uh, we, we run these Tech Thursday sessions, to be precise, every last Thursday of a month. Uh, there are some times when we don't do it because of you know, it's holidays or people are busy and th things like that. But we are a bunch of, of friendly people who are looking for more friends so that we can do things in the HE sector, in the FE sector, and bring about some change that we are all passionate about, so like-minded. Um, so um, if you would like to be a part of this uh, group, you can, of course, go onto our web page, which is over here. Um, if you just search Old South, uh, it will come up. Uh, it should come up. If not, if you went to the Alt website, then through the um, groups and uh, section that you will find us. But I think as my colleagues can put the links there in the chat. And you can contact Lucinda if you wanted to join uh, via her email. I'm sure she'll put a note for that in the in the chat. So what do we do? As I said, we meet regularly and talk about issues around um, good good practice and, and challenges um, in a workplace related to learning technologies. And usually we meet last Thursday of uh, a month from 12 to 1. But this time we have three sessions coming up because we are launching a series on assessment, uh, in particular uh, about uh, inclusive assessment. But also today we're going to talk about innovative uh, techniques and technologies that that are uh, bringing about some some turbulence, perhaps, or some change uh, or disruption through uh, as technology is often um, related to. So uh, about the uh, the coming two events, uh, we are, as we said, we're launching a working party uh, around the area of affecting change in assessment practices within within HE and FE, and this is our, our scope and objectives. If you'd like to be part of this, uh, I'll, I'll give you a link. You can you can join that uh, action as well, call to action. Uh, but uh, this is a list of of events that are that we have have planned. So next week, then on Thursday, same time. We have Dr. Sarah Broadbury from NTU, who's going to be talking about open and innovative assessment techniques that has been uh, used during the pandemic. And uh, there are some ideas that were worth, we thought we were worth sharing with, with the rest of the community. So we're bringing Sarah, who will also be um, helping us with the with the um, working party work alongside other members of the All South group. Um, then on the next week, following from there, it's been myself and a colleague from my uh, department, uh, Jeb, uh, who will be talking about uh, techniques to engage students uh, during exams, exam revision, uh, that kind of thing. So assessment and preparation for assessment. So the focus will be there and how to make that more open and um, inviting. Then we have other uh, speakers and, and I've listed them here on, on their all on assessment. So um, we like to have more people involved. If you have something to share, uh, we'd like to consider that around assessment. Please do contact us separately to be part of this. Now, that is the uh, link I was talking about. If you want to join the, um, uh, the, the working party that we are uh, launching um, from this week onwards, here is the link for you to complete. Uh, and join us and we'll be updating you on our activities and obviously involving you with that work. Now, today, what is it today? We are going to talk about assessment and I asked in the regular sort of style of, of these sessions is with, I asked Chat GVD, what is assessment? And this is what it came up with. This is about it's evidencing knowledge, skills and abilities and so on. So you all know all of, all this anyways, but I'm just checking whether ChatGPT understands it. Yes, it does. And I ask it, well, with, with you around, with ChatGPT around, what is the future of assessment going to be like? You know, obviously we're all worried about assessment uh, offenses and academic integrity. So I asked this question. It came up with, with these suggestions that you could use open-ended uh, questions in exams or use scenarios and project-based learning, critical thinking. These are the things that says, uh, are going to obviously not as badly affected as 
as some of the other assessment formats. But again, you take this as a bit with a pinch of salt because it's always developing. Uh, chat GPT. Then I ask it, uh, what does it think about the knowledge it holds about the world and 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 science and technology and so on? So it says I'm highly knowledgeable, but I have limited scope, uh, limited contextual knowledge, limited multimodal understanding, and so on and so forth. But I can I can be inaccurate as well. But it's uh, being regularly updated to include things like uh, having uh, the ability to have empathy cultural uh, awareness, security, intent, law, science, etc. So it's constantly uh, upping its game. Um, in terms of uh, own skills, if I asked it, it, it gave these list of things. And in, in the end was interesting. It could mentor, coach, exemplify concepts, uh, clarify signposts, resources. So these are quite kind of things that you do with your students. So it's claiming to be able to do those things. Um, then I ask her, what about your own emotions, Chad GBD? What do you what what do you feel about right now? It says I'm unable to feel lack of empathy, impersonal tone, lack of emotional intelligence. So these are the things that it came up with. I can't be surprised, shock, and so on and so forth. Uh, then I ask it, can you experience uh, anything? It says, uh, well, how experienced you are in, in doing the things that you claim you're doing. Sorry. So it says, I'm not perfect. I'm trained, not experienced. Uh, tested and evaluated against benchmark statement, benchmarks and data sets widely used around the world. So instead of saying that you're experienced, you're saying you're tested and you're popular, you're, you're used around the world. Then I asked, what about my colleagues, what about my educational sort of academic colleagues who are um, aware of you being there? What do you think about their knowledge uh, and its uh, use in, in the future with you around? So then it came back with things like that's irreplaceable. It's always evolving. It is needed to do jobs. Then ask it, what about the experience of, of people? Uh, it says it is valuable and essential. It gives rich and nuanced understanding of the world, critical in arts, literature, philosophy, but also in STEM and R&D. So it's kind of pushing people into that area where it can't do so research and development or or come up with original things or or lived experiences which are nuanced and, and so on. Uh, then I ask it, what about the skills you see humans uh, have which will be useful uh, since your arrival and maybe uh, in future when, when you're commonplace, you know, things like um, generative text and other AI is commonplace. It says creativity, intuition, trial and error, uh, emotional intelligence, and so on and so forth. Uh, it also put in the end safety and ethics, uh, interpretation data. So I'm thinking some of these are already its forte, but some of them are perhaps still um, for frontiers, which for future, I guess, for it to, to, to become expert in. Then I ask it eventually uh, about the emotions people are having at the moment. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure uh, you will be in either one or, or the other or combined camps. So if you would perhaps uh, want to say that in the chat, about how you're feeling, maybe that'll that'll and and why uh, that'd be nice to see in the end uh, when we collect the, the messages from you all. Excited, want to I uh, want people want to use me. Uh, it says staff would want to use me to give personalized feedback. It suggests some ways in which you can use it, offer them new opportunities and so on and so forth. And and uh, it would also be concerned about jobs, ethical concerns, privacy, unintended consequences, skepticism about accuracy. Are these the feelings you're having about chat GB, GPT? Perhaps they are. Um, what it does not did not say immediately was about the academic integrity and, and so on. And then I ask it eventually, OK, well, if you're going to be around for a long time, what can we do as humans to overcome our negative feelings about you? And it says, OK, embrace me, develop me. Use it as a tool. Use me as a tool to improve effectiveness, efficiency, inclusion. Now, that's something I don't know why it picked those words, because in my thesis, I talk about technology being used and useful for improving effectiveness, efficiency and inclusiveness as well. But anyways, um, inclusive language use and learn more about inclusive best practice, legal requirements. Stay informed as I'm involving value of human connection. Don't forget that. Of course. So, yeah, with all of that mm -hmm. kind of backdrop, I want to I want to invite our, our next sort of uh, speaker for today, who is uh, Manjinder Kant, who has very kindly agreed to come on and talk to us about 
the silver lining perhaps in, in this in this cloud about use of AI in assessment for uh, for supporting us, for helping us do our do our tasks. So over to, to yourself, uh, Manjida, I'll make you the presenter or you've already presented our country. Um, over to you then. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I, are you able to share your screen now? I'm yeah. sharing my screen now. I'm not sure if you can see it. I think no, it's actually mine. There we go. Uh, yeah, it's normal. Yeah. Great. Over to you. So welcome and thank you for coming here. Thank you very much for that, Manish. And I, I really liked your introduction there as well. I think it's quite um, quite a novel little thing there, uh, getting ChatGPT to uh, answer the questions that you might have of it in some sense, um, which is quite interesting. Um, I think it's one of those things that you know happens once in a in a generation where everybody kind of coalesces around a topic and finds it really quite interesting. We actually ran a round table yesterday and we had over 600 people sign up to just, you know, have people discuss about chat GPT AI and, and higher education. There are a lot of interesting concerns and kind of future looking potential that we'd all seen and were discussing. Was, so I'm looking forward to seeing what, um, what uh, this group also has to think. So the short um, kind of title of this talk is that things are changing and we really do just need to be ready. So the first question I think a lot of people have is what is artificial intelligence? Now, <laughs> I've got a quite a skeptical look at this statement, but I personally think it's pretty much a catch all term from a commercial perspective. So I know plenty of companies um, out there who are using it to get a lot of funding or to try to sell their platforms more effectively um, and uh, and all this sort of stuff. But from a technical perspective, it, I always think of artificial intelligence as primarily rooted in statistics. The idea being that you use techniques, often quite sophisticated mathematical techniques implemented with really sophisticated kind of um, uh, technology and data techniques to classify items and occasionally generate content. Uh, so you'll see here in my diagram on the right hand side that the idea being that, you know, if you have your input, you get some sort of classification out. And the training data, which is often large, um, kind of gets combined with some sort of statistical understanding. And this looks like AI. Now, this is what we've kind of thought about AI for a very long time. You know, I give it a character or some handwriting or something like that. It can identify what character is, you know. Um, or if I give it a picture of a person, we can identify which person it is. We've seen our phones be able to classify which groups of people are our family members and that sort of thing. And it's become commonplace. And classification of images and written text and all that sort of stuff has been commonplace for quite a while. These algorithms have also been used in social media to show us advertisements and show us posts that are going to cause more engagement and also show us more time, give us more time on the platform that by allowing these uh, companies to you know, generate more ad advertisement revenue. But transformer models are quite a different beast. Now, the idea is still the same. You're still using large training data and statistical understanding. But the technology itself is quite powerful. This existed for quite a few years now, but it's used in ChatGPT and other large language models. And the reason transformer models are different is because they are so powerful um, and, and generating of content, which is, I think, for a long time, people have thought is a uniquely human trait. Um, and that's kind of what's challenging people recently when ChatGPT has come out. Now, most people weren't interested in GPT until the chat part came out. Now, GPT itself stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. The GPT models have existed for years. GPT-3, which is the core of chat GPT, well, technically 3.5, let's not get into too many nuances, is, um, has existed for over a year now. People have been using it for, uh, um, for, uh, marketing and for coding for ages. In fact, Grade ourselves have been using GPT to help us generate marketing content and help us generate uh, blog posts or at least paragraphs of blog posts here and there to help um, kind of speed up that sort of stuff. 
Uh, and you know, co GitHub Copilot is has been used to help people generate code um, as well. And it's 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 kind of interesting how the chat component has been added recently and has made it one of the most fast has made it the fastest growing platform ever. Now, GPT itself is trained on the internet, trained on large, faster text data, has billions of parameters. But at the end of the day, it is just, um, from a layperson's point of view, predicts the most likely next best word. Um, from a computer science point of view, I should be saying token, but I'm going to be using the word word uh, just for simplicity's sake. The idea being, it's like, you know, you're autocomplete on Gmail or the, the little autocomplete you have on your phone when you're texting or typing, but just supercharged beyond belief because it can take everything that you've typed before and run it through itself to be able to generate the next best token very sophisticatedly. In some sense, it's actually kind of magical that this technology even works in the first place, but it does, as we can see. The chat component is slightly different. So what the chat component is, is that it's an agent that sits in between you and GPT. The idea being that it takes what you have type into it and it can convert it into a prompt that GPT can use to then auto complete the answer. And that actually, because of the nature of the way this agent has been created, does actually cause quite a few issues. Uh, let me just open the chat as well so that I can see any comments as well. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll try to answer them. Uh, as, as we go on as well. Now, I think the question most people have is really, how powerful is it? In short, it's incredibly powerful. It can code. I've talked about a bit about GitHub Copilot. It's existed for a while. Um, people have been using ChatGPT and Copilot to be able to write platforms and uh, like scripts from scratch. Uh, it can write. Marketeers have been using tools like this like Jasper AI and other types of tools to write copy and blog posts and social media posts uh, and refining those types of things. It can even pass exams. It's passed the Wharton MBA exam, the US medical license exam, the law school exam. It is genuinely really powerful. So should you be worried? Well, yes and no. I think immediately, we're, we're as educators, we're quite worried about students using it to cheat. Now, um, students using it to cheat, it turned, so we, the survey that we ran yesterday found that of the cohort of people who came, around 77% or so of uh, educators in higher education are worried about students using it to cheat. But on the same side, detectors are being built and we're kind of doing a reflective look at what assessment even means and why we do particular types of assessment uh, and gearing that so that we do different types of assessment that cannot just be just plugged and played into chat GPT. You know, this type of technology will be an industry soon. In some sense, it already is. And one of the things that I kind of really advocate for is teaching AI literacy, not only to our students, but, you know, to our peers, because kind of shutting our eyes to this technology being available is never going to really help. Now, can it be used to reduce workload? Yes. I've seen examples of this technology being used to create lesson plans, summarize large, vast quantities of content um, into kind of different lecture content, or at least the basis of lecture content, which can then be used to, with your own kind of finesse. People have actually been quite um, interesting about this. And uh, what's it called? They've uh, used ChatGPT to create example answers for the questions that they usually ask and um, and then getting the students to critique it, which is quite interesting as a learning tool. Um, but at the same time, you know, it has limitations. So for example, it can't do maths or like physics uh, or subjects where you require sophisticated but strong, subtle links between topics. Um, it's a confident liar. Because of the nature of GPT, because it's just predicting the next best word and the next best token, it is going to lie to you because it's just creating 
uh, things out of thin air. And this is kind of where you have the alignment problem in the training with the chat component, which I'll get into soon. Um, and the creations can also feel kind of uncanny. And then this, this kind of gets back into um, the, the alignment problem as well, with the chat component as well. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here uh, or and comments that I'd, I'd like to address. So um, Microsoft is is embedding its own AI words into uh, Word, PowerPoint, and Outlook too. Yep, yeah, that's very important to think about. It's already in Bing. In fact, a more powerful version of GPT is in Bing, which is in, in beta, which I've, I've, I've had access to. Um, it is slightly more powerful. It's quite interesting, but it, it, there's no like remarkable difference in terms of like a step function. In terms of assessing how good you are at using the applied AI to the applied field and practice, I think that's a very good point. Um, using this technology and incorporating it into our education as a way of assessing how good we are. It sounds a little bit ridiculous when we say it now, but we at school level and GCSE level, we have calculator exams and non-calculator exams to assess how good we are at using these types of tools. Uh, Liz has got a good question here about opening up a divide between people who can pay for these services and those who can't. I've got a slide about that coming soon, so we'll get on to that. Um, yeah, and chat, yes, exactly. That, um, that uh, sorry, Lucian has said here that chat GP doesn't always get things right, and that's due to the nature of the predictive text elements, and students have found out that the hard way. I had a great story from uh, Professor Alison Davenport who said that a student used it to submit some work, and clearly it had used a technique that was really well outdated and wasn't correct, um, but because it was just using this large source of data, it was just kind of autocomplete, this sort of things. Um, and then uh, we've got a couple more things about reducing workload. Is that, yes, Ruth has a really good point here, is that every um, kind of answer response that you've had from ChatGPT the sources provided simply don't exist. The links don't exist and they're broken. I think this is, just, again, going back to the whole point, which is, it is just generating the next best token, and um, it's not doing anything like rather sophisticated. Now, I do want to be clear here: GPT-4, when it's integrated into Bing, can provide sources because it can cite the um, web pages that's pulled information from. So th there is a slight difference there, and as we start to get these tools to become slightly more sophisticated, it might be able to pull more references slightly more um, effectively. And um, yeah, so, so let's move on to the next slide here. I think a lot of people are worried about detection. Like, if people are cheating, how do we actually detect AI-generated content? Uh, in some sense, you know, we were all worried about people using Wikipedia and all these online sources. Um, um, but then tools like Tatin and other plagiarism checkers came about and there was less worry about this. So I think the knee-jerk reaction that a lot of educators are having is, well, let's be able to detect this so that we can then at least, you know, use this more effectively as a learning tool. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Detection isn't going to be a catch-all. In some sense, it's an arms race um, uh, between the tools that are generating this con and also um, the tools that are detecting this content. At least initially, we can use things like signals within the output. So there are tools like GPT-0, GPT-Kit, and Grade ourselves, we're working on a tools that work on this premise. The idea being that there are different types of parameters when you can analyze language using NLP to work out whether or not text was written by a human or not. For example, GPT-0 uses something called perplexity and burstiness of language. So perplexity is effectively the, the randomness of the words that are used. AI-generated content tends to be less random in the word usage. And the burstiness of language, as GPT-0 defines it, is um, kind of the variability in sentence length. Um, and uh, human-written content is quite bursty. The, the, the sentence length varies quite a bit. Um, but as these tools get more sophisticated and as we kind of ask it to be prompted in a particular way of writing, we might be able to navigate these things. It's not going to be a 100% catch-all because at the end of the day, it's a statistical measure of the actual thing it's looking at. Now, on the other side of things, yes, exactly. Um, uh, 
uh, Edna has got a good comment there. GPT-0 can recognize a GPT poem for them yesterday. And that really is just highlighting that, you know, as these tools get more sophisticated, like GPT-0, I believe, uses GPT-2 to be able to analyze some of the perplexity and burstiness. But, you know, if we're already on GPT-3, GPT-4, you know, GPT-N, let's just say, right? It's, it's an arms race. And do we really want to be getting into this arms race? Now, the next thing here, is watermarking or fingerprinting. Now, this image is from Kirchenbau et al. It's a very readable paper. I recommend people read it. Um, and the idea here is on the model side rather than the user side, right? And on, so what this means is that if we effectively split the word space or the token space of particular words that can be output by the model into red words and green words such that on average, Normal, normal human languages should have around 50% of red and green words, we can actually bias the green words slightly and reduce uh, the percentage of red words slightly, such that it doesn't affect remarkably the outcome of the words, but when we look at the co work that's been generated by AI, it will be remarkably more green than red, giving a statistically significant um, indicator that this text has actually been written by artificial intelligence. Uh, now, this obviously depends on those people providing the models. OpenAI have said they're going to be working on a watermark, but other tools may not, and open source tools may not. And um, you know we can't fully be relying on this. So I guess one of the things I want to say is that detection is here, but is it necessarily the thing that should, we should be focusing on? And is it something that we should be relying on? In my personal opinion, no, but it is a tool that we can use to just kind of iron out kind of the edge cases of like just uh, absolutely like uh, like uh, absolutely ridiculous cheating. And there's another comment here saying that uh, from Sheila saying that it's uh, very well noticed that GPT-0 can provide many false positives. And I think that's also very important to note here you know, detecting AI generated content is one thing, but if we accidentally, you know, say that students work is AI generated when it wasn't, um, that's going to cause a lot of issues too. Um, so I know like this is a bit of a, <laughs> everybody kind of says this um, a lot when it comes to education, but whenever I think about kind of new tools and new things incorporating within uh, education, I often come back to Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, as at least as a you know as, as a little pulse on, on where to kind of go here, and you know one could argue that from the invention of Google and Wikipedia, that you know the remember balance of the taxonomy has largely been rendered irrelevant within the workplace. Not to say that it's not used uh, and not important for the education piece. But the question we kind of need to ask ourselves is where does AI affect the rest of these things? You know, AIs can be used to explain ideas and concepts. You know, it can be used to, um, it's not that good at applying the, the different things, um, but, you know, as AI evolves, we, we might be able to start to apply things a little bit more as well. Analyzing is quite difficult. Like I said, um, a lot of the content is uncanny service level. It struggles to draw connections that are very subtle, but rigorous, um, as is with physics and maths you know, to evaluate and justify and defend. I think this one's quite interesting because if you ask it to defend itself, it will, but it will also often produce garbage as a result of it. And this comes into that whole uncanny aspect of that sort of stuff and creating new and original work. I know that, you know, when we uh, like create poetry or create prose or ask it questions as we did at the beginning of this talk, you know, it might feel like it is creating new and original work, but then there's an aspect of which it's recycling old work. And there's always a balance here. And how do we kind of use, look at how AI enhances these components of the taxonomy, but also how we can use it to assess our students' ability to leverage their technology in the first place. Um, so here we go. Clement's got a comment here saying that there are also paraphrasing tools that can take outputs from chat GPT to make it more human sounding and effectively remove the watermark if it even existed. I think that's a, that's an interesting component. Of course, it can't just be a, um, you know, like a big library, open source library as to what, what color the words are, you know, otherwise you could just use a synonym tool to just completely remove that, um, the watermarking aspect. There'll be, there has to be a huge 
uh, kind of like a seeding process that would that be a whole thing. Um, and and you know even if we do have like these really good detection tools, they're just not going to be perfect because at the end of the day, they're based on statistical measures. And there are additional issues with generated content. So I've talked about this alignment problem quite a bit now. Now, what actually is it? So ChatGPT is trained by training an agent to produce good prompts. Now, normally, um, uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. So it's training by training an agent to create good prompts. Now, normally we would ask a human, hey, can you create some good prompts for us so that we can actually use that as a training set? But in practice, it's quite difficult to get people to train, uh, to create that, that type of data. Instead, what OpenAI did, which was to be fair, quite smart, is they reviewed the output of what was going on and use that to train the trainer, <laughs> effectively like a reinforcement learning based system to um, when this, within this AI system. What that means though, is that you know you can either thumbs up or thumbs down the output. And if you've seen ChatGPT, you'll notice in the corner, there is a thumbs up and thumbs down that's still there from that training de data. But the problem there is not all people know what quality output looks like in all domains. I'm not a poet. I know the simple, completely ideas about poetry and rhyming words and, and that sort of thing. You know, iambic patameter is a phrase that was <laughs> uttered when I did GCSE English. Um, but um, I don't understand poetry very deeply. Um, and so when we're talking about the agent, it's actually incentivized to lie. Because if it created an output that was, hey, this is, uh, I don't actually know the answer versus uh, a relatively convincing surface level lie, somebody who doesn't know the, what quality output is, is more likely to approve the subtly convincing lie versus um, uh, the saying that something is, 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 is just uh, not, not known. At the same time, uh, you have the problem of creating kind of middle of the road content, surface level content. And the reason for this is because it, the way the reward model works, it's going to get just as much reward for creating really basic examples of stuff versus creating in-depth examples of stuff. Because if there was a very sophisticated poem, I as a layperson would not know what that actually is a good poem or not. I am more likely to actually give it a, a thumbs down than a thumbs up and thereby it's actually incentivized to create kind of more surface level content there's a huge problem when it comes to embedded bias. See, these large language models are trained on the internet and the Bing AI is also connected to the internet so that um, it, uh, it updates itself. Um, and the bias of the content is therefore embedded within the model and wide scale usage of these tools propagate more bias more effectively. It's like shining a mirror on ourselves, but with a magnifying glass. You know, it's absolutely, it can be absolutely horrific. And I don't think there's been enough kind of oversight into looking at the bias that exists within this data um, and also the bias that will exist in future large language models. Now, there's the aspect of financial access as well. And that is, well, you know, ChatGPT Plus is $20 a month. Um, and it's quite likely that the paid models are going to be better than their free counterparts. And this it immediately makes me worry about the financial inequality gap, allowing people with access to means, have access to technology to uh, supercharge the, the difference between those two kind of groups and that social inequality. Now, when we discussed this yesterday, we had um, a provost state that it's quite likely that, you know, if these tools are um, show value that institutions are quite likely to be able to procure these tools for all students at the university level. Now, the university market, from a business point of view, this is my commercial background, the university market and the school market are quite different markets. Um, so even if this might be true at university level, it might be way too late by the time we actually have um, uh, this, uh, this done. 
So I'm just going to go through the comments again. So do, 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 do. here we go. So Clement's talking about uh, reciting pre-existing work. Isn't that what a lot of creating new knowledge is? Like, I, you know, there is a common saying, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun or everything is, um, everything is a, I forget what the, the saying is now, everything is a remix, that's right. Um, and that there is an aspect of that, certainly. Um, I think um, we're going to have to see really how much creation of new knowledge and new content is really recycling versus um, creating new things. And I think that it's going to be a very interesting time with chat GPT. Uh, Manish has made a comment regarding the arms race that I mentioned. Um, and the, the idea being that the tools like this need to develop student knowledge and metacognitive skills, and that it can only be used to improve higher education and make it more inclusive. I think that's completely true. If we have equitable access to these tools, there's a future out there we, where we have very inclusive education. Uh, we've talked to students and they say they're using ChatGPT to explain topics and ideas to them from the point of view of professors or a student to kind of get different viewpoints and different ways of understanding things it can be really quite interesting uh, to live in uh, this kind of time. Um, and then there's a huge, Liz Avery's made a comment regarding the human cost of workers that are used to train the models. And that can also bias income as well. That's, I haven't read that particular article, but um, I'm sure it'll be quite a good read. Um, it is not yet truly capable of creativity intuition. It's limited to working within the parameters of the data and algorithms have trained on. So the definition of the word new is important here. That's actually a very good point. Um, and again, I think, um, Tony, we're going to really see how much new is recycled versus never been seen before. Clement's got a comment regarding chess players. They never could think that machine could do their job. When, we can actually, looking back, we, we can actually explain why chess is easy to do for a machine, but it's always easy to explain things that have already happened. Uh, you know, I, I'm actually a, um, you know, a really big chess fan and looking at the, the history of how Garry Kasparov versus uh, Deep Blue, I believe it was, and, and the way things worked then. I think quite an interesting point here is there was kind of a, there was a, there was a, there was a limit of explainability when it came to chess and algorithms. And for example, Stockfish 12 or Stockfish 13 or something like that was using algorithms based around uh, calculation of point values of particular pieces and doing in-depth uh, tree propagation. So looking forward into the future and finding out moves. But when Alpha Zero came out and now those kind of uh, neural network techniques are being embedded into future kind of tools, explainability as to why those chess engines are making those moves is really hard. We went from a system where actually, you know, moving a pawn two, two spaces forward is going to lose you a knight in this one particular line, which is super specific, to I don't know. <laughs> this That's what the computer said. And explainability is a huge part of artificial intelligence that a lot of different components are missing. Um, Ed, uh, Edna has a comment regarding uh, ideas, but does it create a sense of mistrust in the classroom? How do we counteract this? For me, this is about AI literacy. Like I remember being a student and when Wikipedia was new, everybody, every teacher would be telling me, hey, you can't just use Wikipedia. It's an open source set of information. Anybody can edit it, edit, you know? And in some sense, that's what gave it power. But we were also taught, look, use this as a starting place. Find the references, do your own research and stuff. If we have a good source of information for AI literacy and AI ethics and understanding the bias that could be in there, we should be able to counteract these problems. I'm scrolling through here with the other comments. You know, Juan says that sooner or later, edu every educator will have a tool like this, like any other lab tool. That's quite an interesting comment. Like uh, when we look at like the mathematics and the physics kind of tools, we have tools like Mathematica, uh, which can solve really complex equations and systems, et cetera, uh, analytically exactly. And we don't necessarily, oh, like, <laughs> this is going to absolutely ruin everything. We still teach students how to solve those types of equations um, because the point of those equations is not necessarily to get the answer. 
The point of those equations is to teach them a way of learning that metacognition that's been mentioned multiple times, that critical thinking as well. Um, and yeah, there are, there are comments about tripping up GPT, which is also true. Currently, it doesn't go past 2021. That is correct for ChatGPT, but it's not true for Bing GPT, which is integrated into Microsoft. That is live and up to date, connected to the internet, and will always be up to date unless they change anything after I, after this talk. Um, okay, so I'm going to go into the next slide here. So the next section of this is talk is is really about an AI assessment assistant. This is kind of where I sit and GRADE exists. So we built GRADE while um, we were postgraduate students. And we noticed a few things. We noticed that the assessment design and delivery occurs in segmented systems. You'd be creating content on like a PDF document and you'd be giving it on, a, on your learning management system. Students would be doing it on a piece of paper and uploading a PDF and then you'd be printing it off or you're marking it really weirdly and you'd be copying and pasting the marks into an Excel spreadsheet. It was just like a nightmare. And often when marking was done, it was very repetitive and time consuming uh, and thereby expensive where we were using uh, you know, postgraduate students to mark that work. And when we looked at the NSS scores, you know, feedback was often the lowest scoring, uh, assessment feedback was the lowest scoring uh, education delivery category. Um, the idea of grade is to really solve all those issues. The idea is to design and deliver assignments from one place, use technology and artificial intelligence to give feedback faster, and to improve the rubric system to improve consistency. The idea being that you know you create your assignment on grade, the student attempts it on grade, you mark it in grade, which allows you to give it, you, allows you to mark work quicker and more consistently, and it allows you to reduce turnaround time. Now, we've been talking a lot about AI, so let's talk a little bit about how Grades AI actually works as well. Um, so the idea being that when a student response comes in, we basically ask the AI a question. And the question is, has this answer been seen before within the set of the questions that have been previously marked for this particular question? If it hasn't, that's when it's given to a teacher. They mark it, they give it high quality feedback, and we use that with AI learning such that when the next answer comes in, we can look at the differences between those answers and we can look at the uh, feedback that you gave to the first set of answers and provide partial or complete automation depending on the thresholds that are available with the AI. Um, now, I appreciate that this is just a lot of words. So uh, I want to actually show you what it looks like um, here. So, uh, is it, has it changed tab? Hello? Oh, okay. I think that's what uh, happened. Yeah. We can hear you. My okay. Yeah, I think my share broke. Okay. Is that better? Is that? Uh, it should come up, I guess. Yeah. It's there we go. Okay. Apologies for that. No problem. Uh, technical hiccup there. Um, so the first thing I kind of want to highlight here is this, this rubric. Uh, the idea being here that this rubric is shared amongst all markers with the same question to allow for consistency. If I edit any one of these pieces of feedback, this edit is retroactively applied to all other students with the same feedback to ensure consistency. I can rearrange this rubric and stuff without bothering other markers and have things kind of set up in my own particular way. The way I've given feedback here is I've kind of highlighted the relevant area and I've given it the feedback that I want to give. This is pre-written feedback just to save some time. And I've only marked two questions here, but already the feedback, the AI has started to learn. So in this question, you can see, in this answer, sorry, we can see that the AI is suggesting feedback based on the way that I've marked those previous questions, and it's highlighted this for me. 
there's a 50% accuracy confidence that it has here. And this is based on the, the previous data. If I accept this and we move on to the next script, we can update those percentages as we move on. And if we just kind of go into different questions, we can see the different confidence levels that the AI has for these particular types of questions. And it's not only for mathematics, but it's also for, um, let's see if this broke it. No, it's switched. It's also for short answer text. So, you know, here we've looked at um, kind of the idea of like understanding natural selection and, you know, it's understanding a few key differences between these answers, which affects the confidence percentage. Um, but if there's nothing to say, then it won't pick up anything and it has different kind of areas that um, it, it will adapt and understand. Now here, the difference is quite low. If this for whatever reason is incorrect, I can just delete this feedback and uh, the platform will actually learn the differences that um, uh, it can do for those particular types of questions and understand the nuances of, of the, the, the way your marking work. Uh, we've got a hand up from Manish. Yes, just wanted to remind you that some people may wish to leave at 55 because they may have a meeting physical somewhere else. Um, but yep. yeah, please continue. And, and you've been taking questions on the chat anyway. So thank you for, for that. Um, yeah, I'll uh, leave the floor back to you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've only got a couple of slides left anyway. So in terms of using grade, you know, we've estimated that depending on the way, how much marking you do and how much you pay for it, you can save around a quarter of a million pounds a year, depending on all those types of factors. We found out that you get faster, more consistent feedback. So we've reduced turnaround time in cases where it's been used from three weeks down to like three days sometimes, and the consistency of feedback has increased. And we see, um, now we haven't uh, fully tested this yet, but the hypothesis is that um, improved feedback can, will, should result in improved learning. Um, in terms of a case study at the University of Birmingham, even if they didn't use the artificial intelligence, they still found it significantly more easy to provide feedback and still found it significantly faster. And when we looked at the artificial intelligence component for mathematical responses, we found that you could reduce the amount of time it took to mark work by up to 89% and increase the feedback by up to seven times. Um, and you know we're, we're always building this community of other educators using GRADE. We've worked, we've partnered with JISC, for example, and other universities as well. And our algorithms are always improving. For example, we're working on an essay marking uh, and report marking solution uh, as well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take some, some questions now uh, from the comment. Um, so, so people can raise their hands or type in the chat, whichever is convenient, uh, given that it's like eight minutes or so. Well, if people want to leave at 55, do uh, complete the survey that I've posted. Uh, I'm giving us sort of feedback about the session. But also, if you want to join the uh, group for uh, making change in um, inclusive assessment practices, please do that as well. Over to you. Oh, sorry. Uh, can grade work with handwritten submissions? Uh, yes, Liam, it can. You just don't get the artificial intelligence component, but you do get the workflow benefits. So, for example, um, uh, if we get a PDF example here, the idea is that you uh, draw a region over the area that you want to give feedback to and you link the feedback. And we're working on connecting the artificial intelligence component into this engine with optical character recognition, which we already have in the platform for students. What sort of solution do you suggest for long form written assignments? So at the moment, we have a solution that we is still in beta, so it's not fully released yet. But the idea is we can, you can grade essays and reports as well. So you can see the reports, you can give it inline feedback like you would, you know, notes in PDFs, but you also get this direct feedback in a compressed a rubric system where you can see all the statements that you want, but if you want to, you can expand it to see the, the particular nuances of the points that you've defined. It allows you to be um, give feedback faster and more clearly uh, all in under one hood. We don't have AI here just yet, but we're using this alongside potential partnership 
to improve um, the AI capabilities for long form content. So can I ask a question uh, as well? Have you seen yep. any uh, improvements in the NSS uh, scores in, in wherever your system is being used at at the moment? Yes, that's a great question. So we it hasn't been implemented long enough for the NSS scores to be measured as a result of where it's been implemented. But we do uh, ask questions regarding that are similar to the NSS. And we find that students find the feedback more consistent. They find the turnaround of feedback um, better. They find the quality of feedback higher. And the quality was defined as kind of um, applicable um, and uh, relevant, um, et cetera, as well from Bloom's taxonomy. Thank you. Uh, if anyone's interested, feel free to um, go to our website. You can like uh, book a session and chat further, et cetera. Thank you. People are sending you lots of thanks and, and they're very um, appreciative of the, of the time that you spent with us. Thank you so much. Um, as well from the team. Uh, if uh, people would like to get involved and uh, you know work with us together, making assessments uh, more inclusive, please join the group and leave us some feedback, which I can pass it on to, to Manjitra later on. We have the chat messages anyways. And uh, we shall see you next Thursday, um, unless you have any more questions for, for any one of us, including Manjitra, our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Because nowadays you have, uh, so I can pause the recording as well. Uh, just a second. Stop recording. <laughs>